This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 86. And welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Kevin Moyer. I'm Peter Rios. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, this episode of Comic Geek Speak is brought to you by E Gerber Products, the industry leader in long term storage sleeves for your collection. Visit them at www.egerber.com. E Gerber Products, the protector for the collector. I got to call them. I have to order more Mylars. I got to finish my Gru run. Yeah, I have to get some too. I wanna. There's some special things that I wanna. Especially bag. So. I put them all. I started putting them on my Titans. So. Yeah, they look so nice, oh, don't it they? Does. Yeah, I know. So I know. Vince, now. Vince out there is going. Nah, 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 nah. I told you so. I told you so. <laughs> and you guys got the two mil ones, right? Yep. Yeah, two mil. So okay, cool. I mean, if you you know the the four mil ones are like unbelievably awesome you know but they're also more expensive exactly, so right, and yeah. you and you really you would you do not need to board the four mills i mean so you you actually could end up saving money or just making your life easier if you if you don't want to mess around with boards or hope to find acid free boards now they sell acid free boards as well but it's like the bags the mylars and the boards together two mil and boards cost more than four mil bags so Really, if you wanted to just get the four mils and just have like, oh, they're so you can barely bend the flaps. Yeah. So it's like, ooh, I like. I know, it. but there's something about it though with having that white border around your comic. Well, that's you, true you too. Know what I mean? yeah. yeah, yeah, it does make it look kind of cool. But I think I will get some four mils for like some of my early Silver Age stuff that some I some really of your Spider Mans or yeah, Daredevils my amazing Spider Mans and Daredevils and maybe even my Iron Mans and such too. That you know, some things that I want to. Prestige. Yeah, the four mils and the one point five mils are only available through Diamond. You can't get them from egerber.com. Well, exclusive. if you're going to get some more, don't you know? Let me know because. Oh yeah, I'll definitely be putting together. Can, or order. check them out at a convention too. Yeah, we. Can. I yeah. mean, they they usually try to attend. And, and they will be. I, oh, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. If Maybe they were we'll going to be at New York or not, York. I don't yeah. remember. Cool. All right. Um, for our contest reminders and our book of the month club reminders, go to our website. ComicGeekSpeak.com. Uh, we have two contests going on right now, so um, get all the information there. And for this episode, we are going to talk to Mr. Tom DeHaven, the author of the new novel It's Superman from Chronicle Books in conjunction with DC. Uh, it's a wonderful Superman story. And so here's Tom. Hello, Tom. Yes, hi. Hi. Welcome to the show. Uh, with me here is Kevin and Peter. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hello. And, uh, well, most of us just read It's Superman. <laughs> well, good. And uh, i got to tell you, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. So, the, before we get into It's Superman, we'll start with uh, the question that we like to ask first, and that is, when did you first start reading comic books? Oh, uh, 1957, when I was eight years old. And uh, do you remember what your first comic was? Uh, yeah, actually it was a, a, a Harvey comic of Dick Tracy, number 103, which I still own. Wow. Yeah, so. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm a... I'm a little unprepared right now. My mind, my mind just blanked out. I apologize for my unprofessionalism here. Um, Where did you go after the Dick Tracy stuff? Did you get into superhero comics? Oh yeah, I mean, um, after, I, I started out as a um, um, as a lover of, of the newspaper comic strip, and, and uh, you know, cut out uh, strips from the, my daily papers and pasted my walls with them. But pretty quickly, I was you know reading action comics and Superman and and Detective Comics and Superboy and all that stuff, yeah. Um, and uh, I went the whole route. You know, I, I bought the first Marvel comics, and I, I guess I was, um, I was, I guess I was 12 or 13 when they started. 
so yeah, I've been I've been the whole uh, um, modern comic book route. <laughs> Are you still reading comics today? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I still get a bunch put aside for me every uh, every week at my comic shop out here in uh, Midlothian, Virginia. What are your What are your uh, current favorites or ones that you enjoy reading? Well, uh, actually, I, I just spent the weekend. My wife was away, and uh, I finally got caught up on on eight months of uh, Why the Last Man, which I guess is uh, along with uh, Fables, um, my favorite currently. Those are those are both great titles. We just did we spotlighted Fables a few months ago, and uh, I hadn't read it before that, and and now I'm my wife and I are both thoroughly enjoying it. Oh yeah, they're really good books. It seems a lot of people that uh, haven't read it before, I'm, I'm included, is that uh, after they read it, they just can't. They want to read more. It's well, it sounds those... like a dopey premise, so it's hard to get people to to buy into it. But uh, once you uh, get past that, it's really terrific. Yeah. Now I guess we'll uh, we'll skip ahead to your to your novel. Um, uh, what what made you want to tackle the subject of Superman, which might be the most written about superhero of all time? What made you decide that you could put your mark on this book that would be different from from all others? Well, there's a story behind that. Uh, I, for, uh Beginning in, in 1984, I, I, I published in, uh, my, uh, a trilogy of novels about cartoonists, um, uh, about a, an imaginary comic strip. The first one was called Funny Papers, and the second one, which was set in the, the first one, set in the 1890s, and the second one, which came out in 1996, called Derby Dugan's Depression Funnies, about cartoonists and um, the depression, and also about the beginnings of, of um, comic books. And then the third one, which I published in 2001, was uh, called. Uh, Dugan Underground, which is about the decline of the American comic strip and the rise of the underground um, in the 60s. Um, so I did these books over a course of 20 years and a lot of research. And uh, in um, in 97, uh, I got a, um, a letter and then a telephone call from Steve Corte at DC Comics saying that uh, he uh, and Paul Levitz had read, um, uh, I guess, the first two in this trilogy because um, the third one wasn't out yet. And they really liked it, uh, and apparently they'd been talking about um, uh, how I how I dealt with the 1930s, and they really liked how I wrote about the 30s. And then apparently the conversation moved to the fact that um, no one has done Superman in in his original period since uh, Siegel and Schuster did it. I mean, the original um, uh, George Lothar novel, I guess, was in the 40s sometime. So all the novels uh, after of the Superman have been in the, in various times, but none in the 30s. So. They asked me, would I be interested in in borrowing their character in a way and, and uh, um, developing my own um, Superman novel set in this period that I have written about in a couple of novels and I teach in college. Um, so I said, yeah. I mean, who would turn down an opportunity to uh, you know deal with Superman? I mean, I mean, ordinarily I wouldn't take on another property that wasn't you know that didn't belong to me, but. Um, Superman is, you know, Superman. So um, I said I'd love to, but I was in the middle of, of finishing another book. So uh, what uh, DC did was that, you know, they'd be, there was no rush and it was it wasn't tied to anything. Um, and when I had chance to work up an outline, um, they'd be happy to, to start talking to me again. So in the meantime, they sent me um, regularly. They'd sent me, um, you know, the Superman archives and the Action Comic archives to kind of. <laughs> I guess to remind me in, uh, um, of our conversation, and, and then in 2001, I finally finished uh, this novel I've been working on. Got back in touch with them and worked up a proposal, um, an outline of the of the novel, and they liked it. And then they took it and um, I guess shopped it around to different publishers, and um, and then Chronicle, I guess, was the the highest bidder. Um, so that's the story of how it came to be, and I, I just uh, had a great time. You know, I love writing about the 1930s, uh, and I also um, thought it was an amazing opportunity to, uh, as you say, write about <laughs> the most recognized um, character and to try and do something different and put my own little stamp on it, um, just the way you know, dozens of other writers over 70 years have. Now, the, the one thing that, I, that really stood out in my mind as I was reading your book was and you said that you enjoy writing about the 1930s, and I think that you did a fantastic job because not for one moment did I ever forget 
that I was in the 1930s. You know, I never, I never read a sentence that I pictured in my head the 1990s or the 2000s or, or you know, anything. I always, from the dialogue to the description to everything, it was in the 30s. Um, so I, I assume that you have done exhaustive research about that time period. Oh yeah. Um, over the course of the, I mean, I, I did a novella of a, set in the '30s in in the middle '80s, uh, that was my first time of researching the '30s. So I've been gathering stuff, um, and then I started teaching uh, 1930s uh, culture, the culture and literature of the 1930s in college every so often, uh, and then I did this um, other novel in the mid '90s. So I've been gathering uh, '30s material for quite a while now. But when I was doing the Superman book, I uh, I realized, although I had a lot of stuff on the 30s, I um, I had to get specific stuff for my particular um, time in the 30s. I mean, 1935, and and uh, um, and I had to get a lot of stuff that uh, my other books about the 30s had been set in the East Coast, um, set in New York, and I knew that this would have to be set um, in the Midwest and in California as well as in the East Coast. So I had to do an awful lot of research about. Um, um, that part of the country, and, and I didn't know much about it. So, but uh, fortunately, you know, with the internet, <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> resources. I mean, I knew nothing uh, about farming. I mean, I, I grew up in the city, and so you know, I don't I don't know if I've ever been on a farm in my life. But but then on top of that, I had to say what were farms like in the 1930s. And so, and luckily, you know, there's old memoirs of people who were you know farmers in the in the 1930s, and their journals are on the web, and you know, <laughs> for or published by university presses. So I did a lot of research. I, I think you know the first six months of the work on the book uh, was basically um, research. And uh, um, so the book took me longer. It took me three years to do, which none of us expected um, would, it would take this long. And the book originally was came in at around 1,000 pages. Um, and then last uh, Christmas time, I took the manuscript uh, down to uh, Virginia Beach uh, the week after Christmas when there was nobody there and locked myself in a hotel room and, and cut 500 pages out. I think I'd like to read the full version. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it's very different. There's lots of different characters, and, and uh, there's a lot, lot more about Lex Luthor in, um, in, the, in, the, um, in the long version. Will there be an unabridged version at some time? <laughs> in a, a director's cut? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> uh, I, actually, this is, this is a much faster read, which I like. You know, um, Even at 400 pages, I think it's kind of a fast book, which is, I think, because I, I cut so much. and, and um, uh, So I like that about it. But I did lose a lot. And you know, I was doing interviews uh, last month about the book, and people would ask me questions, and I'd have, I'd have to stop and think, uh, was I talking about the published version, or was yeah. I thinking about the version that doesn't exist and only I know about? How does that, how do you go through a process of cutting out like half the book? I mean, well, it was difficult. Um, I, I took out, as I say, a lot of um, uh, the parallelism between Clark and and Lex. Um, that a lot of that came out, uh, and um, but there were uh, so that was difficult. Um, but a lot of things I I basically lifted out entire characters. Um, so that was difficult too. But if you take them out completely, um, it's um, it's, it's um, less difficult to do than uh, kind of excising parts of, of characters and, and scenes and situations. What part of the '30s um, that you're attracted to made it easy to, to blend into this story? Well, uh, Superman. Uh, I mean, being born in the '30s, um, I kind of. Um, went from the um, whenever I do characters in any kind of novel one of the first things I do is determine when they were born and then I go up and determine when they would have been in school and what would school have been like at this time what would they have learned in school and, and what events would have happened during their childhood that it would have been of, of national or international import that might have had an impact on them so uh, doing that going back and saying that well Clark Kent must have come into the world around, you know, w during World War One, and uh, um, and then I did a lot of research on, you know, what people um, in the 1920s in grammar school or elementary school, you know, were taught and those kinds of things. So that was uh, it was uh, fun to um, uh, kind of uh, build a character profile of, of somebody from the Midwest who would have uh, gone through these experiences and then, you know 
lay on top of that that she's somebody from another planet. Um, so I, I really like the 30s, and I think Superman fits nicely into it. I mean, he seems um, um, you know, part of that uh, uh, wonderful pop culture that, that is the 30s and the movies and, and the radio shows and, and the 30s um, uh, kind of magazines. Uh, and so he seemed to fit seamlessly into the times, not surprisingly, since he was a, um, a creation of it. And I also read, um, uh, along with all the Superman stuff, um, that um, novel Gladiator that um, uh, oh, yeah. um, Siegel and Schuster apparently uh, clearly um, were influenced by the Philip Wiley book. Um, so, and that was so much of a 30s document. Um, so it was easy. I mean, I really, uh, um, Art Spiegelman uh, uh, once said to me that uh, um, uh, he thinks that uh, he has this theory that people are most nostalgic for the decade before they were born. <laughs> And I was born in the late 40s, so maybe that's true. I, I'm very <laughs> nostalgic for the 30s. The, the one thing that I noticed um, is in, in this book, we see a much more human Clark than I think we're used to seeing in the comics and in the movies and, and what have you. I mean, he, he screws up and he breaks the law and... and, and uh, you know, this is something that we are not used to to seeing Clark. I mean, he he's into women and and all that kind of stuff. And some of it, you know, it, it, it appears to be the influence of his friend Willie, who he meets. And um, but but uh, you know, did you get any flack, or did you have to fight any battles to be able to portray Clark that way? Um, no, actually, um, I didn't. Um, DC um, had no problems with um, anything I did with him. I mean, um, I, I tried to keep him, you know, honest uh, to what I thought he would have been like. I mean, someone growing up in an isolated farm in Kansas uh, would have certain qualms about um, being a hero in the world and how you do it and how do you become a hero. And uh, I mean, one of the things that was cut out of the novel was that uh, when he learns how to fly, he has to figure out how to figure out from the air where he is, uh, you know. Um, so all those things, I try to, you know, look at it in a realistic way. And a novelist has a much more, uh, I think, a, or a, more an advantage over a scriptwriter because you can you can get inside. And, and uh, uh, so maybe that's why it seems, you know, he has much more um, kind of human qualities because, it, um, you know, novels are such an interior art form. And uh, um, But as far as... Um, the problems or having any problems I didn't um, I think um, uh, my editors at DC as well as at Chronicle um, liked how I portrayed Clark, Clark and the only thing I've been worried about is I and um, there was a um, I think was, I don't know if it was a, a review that um, said um, that Clark was a, a sullen teenager and somehow that got picked up on blogs and um, and people have been without reading the book were saying that I you know did this uh, uh, caricature of Superman, and uh, I don't think he's stolen at all. <laughs> but no, because I, yeah. uh, uh, that word has been bandied about without you know people actually reading the book. But uh, DC themselves, no, they didn't have any problem with how I did it. Yeah, well, I really, um, I really liked that, and it was one of the things that I, I kind of get tired of seeing Clark always being the perfect angel all the time. Because I mean, as a as a human, it's hard for me to imagine that if I had superpowers, I wouldn't stretch the limits just a little bit every once in a while to my advantage. And it was nice to see Clark be like that. And, you know, then you could certainly see him, you know, as the years go by, become the perfect Boy Scout that he's often portrayed as because he gets used to his powers. But in the beginning, you know, he's a kid. He's 20 years old or whatever. I mean, he's going he's gonna to have some fun every once in a while. Right, and how would you know how to do this stuff until right. you, 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 you screwed up a few times? And uh, I mean, it, it is a kind of coming-of-age story. I mean, so many of the, the um, Superman stories, I mean, you know, even John Burns and, you know, uh, what's that other one that I, I, I like, um, the comic book version? Uh, um, you know, the, they're all coming-of-age stories, but I had the advantage of, of um, you know, being able to get inside this guy and, and, and also had the advantage of, of length. You know, I could do, I could do, uh, um, uh, I could take my time. And also I had the advantage of, of putting him in a world that, that most of the comic book writers um, 
didn't have. You know, they have contemporary times. I had to, I had to, the thirties as my my uh, sandbox. I didn't find um, um, him as sullen as uh, like like you're saying other people did. I I actually thought some of his uh, trepidations and some of his inner monologues or whatever that he came across as alien, which you know that is what he is. You know, he the way he couldn't quite understand certain things, the way. Um, he didn't easily give in to the faith uh, that his parents held. Um, I believe there's a, a part where Ma Kent says something like, you know, about the other side or the afterlife, and and you clearly see that Clark has doubts about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked at it more as, as that was his alien nature coming out, his restlessness almost. You know, that's why he left the farm and went away and did all these, you know, he knew that there was something, something else out there. Yeah, and also the thing that uh, I think there's a, a, think a part where, the, where his father says that, um, uh, you know, the things that should have happened, the natural things that should have happened during childhood didn't happen to him. You know, he didn't have the mumps and he didn't have the measles. And I think those kinds of things of growing up that way and realizing, you know, other people have this and have that and they fall off a horse and they break their leg, you know, all that kind of stuff. And not having that done to you, I mean, that does that would, would change how you see the world, even before you, you know, become a hero or whatever. You know, you just kind of, you have an alien way. You are the only one of the kind. You mentioned that about um, when he becomes a hero. And uh, my own interpretation of reading this, I don't think I ever got the part where he really becomes Superman in this. Was that, um, is that a fair assessment of, of the ending and and uh, and because there was I was almost expecting and maybe this is in the director's cut um, <laughs> a, a, a bigger battle with the robots uh, even though I know that's not the point you know of Lex Luthor's plan I expected it to to come out a little bit more um, but even with his confrontation with Lex he still is very doubtful and Lex really knows how to push his buttons by calling him stupid and and just assuming that Clark is going to, or at that point, Superman is going to work for him. And um, when I finished the book, I went, huh, there is no, for me anyway, there was no point where he actually, you know, where everything was like, okay, now here it is. Well, that's true. I mean, even in that Lex Luthor scene, I mean, he, he bested him because he knew how to, he knew if he made the guy jump off, um, that Clark would, would leave to catch the guy. Even he had just met this guy 10 minutes ago and he'd figured him out. So, um, I think that's true, but uh, the idea of, of the novel uh, originally um, was that it would end in June 1938, when um, the, the cover, at least the cover date of the, of the first action comics. So that's why I was moving toward, uh, and then um, I stopped short of that because I, I, um, uh, I realized somewhere in my research that Our Town, which is my favorite play, <laughs> premiered in February that year. I said, okay, I'll. I think there's so many of the themes that I wanted to, to tie up in that last coda uh, was was involved in, in Our Town. And so that's why I, I stopped it there. But I, I do think what it is is that uh, that last part is is basically, you know, he is becoming, he is Superman. At least he is um, uh, publicly Superman at that point. Uh, and he's becoming, or he's trying to become uh, in his persona, Superman. And yes, you're right. It's not quite there yet. He's he's still um, not quite sure who he is. But he, he is um, Superman enough to leave the theater in the middle um, to go put out a fire. So um, he's still, you know, he's at that point, but not quite the Superman that um, who would be able to figure out things and and uh, um, the Superman of the comic books, for instance. So that was the idea to just have him stop short of. The Superman in the comic books, which is why in the uh, in the coda there, uh, it refers to a couple of the early, very early Superman stories. The, in fact, the first one where he, he saves the, the woman from the electric chair is mentioned in that in that coda. So I just wanted to bring it right up to that point, uh, and then let the as I said in the last paragraph, you know, let all the other versions kick in at that point. I pulled out um, um, DC's Who's Who from 1986, they, they have the entry on the Golden Age Superman, and one paragraph in particular stuck out, uh, stuck, out stuck, stuck out to me was, um, it says, in time, Mary Kent died when John also lay on his deathbed. He told his son to use his mysterious powers for good. Clark 
took this advice to heart, deciding to conceal his identity and use his abilities only as the colorf colorfully clad Superman. And when I read in your novel, uh, Martha dying, and then the scene with Jonathan at the, on his deathbed, um, my knowledge of Golden Age Superman, I, I, I wasn't, I said, I, I questioned, I said, oh, I didn't realize Martha died first. And, and then when I found this, I went, wow, look at that. It is all there. And as you said, you got the archive. So um, this really does follow this Golden Age Superman biography. It's amazing. Oh, it does. In yeah. fact, um, if you notice uh, the sentence, um, there's a sentence the last time he leaves uh, Smallville, not Coda, that the sentence is an absolute description of the panel uh, in the first page of the first Superman story where he's standing in front of the two headstones, even so that there's a strip of black cloud uh, on a diagonal across the moon. I mean, that's a total, um, I did that deliberately, that uh, that is uh, taken, lifted right out uh, and described from the first first comic book story. So that'll make fanboys everywhere rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, the thing about it is I did want to do something original and fresh. Uh, you know, as a novelist, I wanted to to make characters um, that I could live with for two or three years. And um, But I also knew I had a responsibility um, to the character who, you know, I've loved um, since I was a little boy. And I had no intention of uh, of doing a kind of postmodern dissection of him. And I just wanted to be, I wanted to write a good Superman novel. And I, I one of the things that I did... Um, not only read the comic books from those eras, but I, you know, read, look all the Fleischer cartoons and uh, all the movies and the TV shows. I tried to just immerse myself in Superman over the past three years while I was doing it. And uh, I was looking at the first Superman movie with Chris Reeves, and uh, there was a the um, director was interviewed, um, and he said something about you know he just took this on as a job, um, and then the first day on the set. It just hit him. This is Superman. I really can't screw this up. Uh, and, it's, and I kind of felt the same way. I didn't want to screw it up. And I didn't want to make it that uh, people would be like saying, "Oh no, that's not him," uh, or he's, you know, he's being disrespectful or being making fun of it or or whatever. That wasn't my intention at all. Well, that clearly comes across because one of the strong points I felt as far as uh, reading the book was that all the characters. Uh, including Superman and Lex and Lois, and they all seem very real to me. I mean, they were very well flushed out, and you you have a lot of facets of each character and their pos personas, and which makes it you know that much more. Uh, you want to divulge into it. You want to learn more about these characters because they're so flushed out, and and it really gives you a sense of realism, and especially that you focused on. New York, and and didn't you know try to to paint it as Metropolis or you know you just it's New York and and that's all there is to it. Well, thanks. I mean, I really tried to make it a realistic novel where all the background stuff, all the movies that are being that are coming out, all the news events are real, and yet I had I, you know it is a fantasy, so I had to kind of kind of slide into you know um, from from that realism into the world of robots and and still trying to maintain that uh, illusion of fantasy, which was one of the, the fun things for, for me uh, doing the book. And uh, the other thing was to make these characters um, three-dimensional. Um, uh, if you're reading a novel, it's a different kind of experience than if you're reading, you know, a comic book. And um, so I wanted to, to make the characters um, as rich as I could and so that they would seem, even though they are they're kind of iconic uh, fantasy characters, that they would have enough body um, to um, entertain or hold a reader for, for, you know, the 20 hours or whatever it is that takes to, to uh, read a novel. So that's why I would worked hard to, to um, for instance, Lex, um, as, as um, evil as he is, 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 the, is the most uh, racially tolerant person in the, in the whole novel. Um, he won't have anyone make slurs against um, any ethnic group. Uh, and Lois is um, a character I really worked hard uh, on to try and make her like the character in the early comic books and like the character in the, in the Fleischer cartoons, um, and also to make her a character who would be um, a 30s kind of person, not not a not a 90s kind of person or or a you know 2000 um, kind of woman, but uh, someone who would be of her of her time and yet um, um, someone we could. Um, as a as a hero too. So, 
I, I did have a lot of fun um, working those three characters primarily, and then my other ones that I made up myself to try and make them fit in with with the with the uh, um, the borrowed ones. Is Willie uh, a Jimmy Olsen uh, character? Yeah, he's a Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> he's a Jimmy Olsen. He was at first he was going to be Jimmy Olsen. Uh, uh, or not Jimmy Olsen, he was going to be, his alias was going to be Jimmy Olsen uh, and when he was on the run. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, um, um, DC really didn't like that idea very much, so um, <laughs> uh, I changed it. But yeah, he was supposed to be uh, a Jimmy Olsen. Kind of, he wasn't supposed to be the Jimmy Olsen, but he was supposed to assume that um, identity while he was in Kansas. What has the uh, fan response been like? Well, it's been really interesting and I think really, really positive. For a while, um, it took a long time for people to realize this book was out there, and, and um, which kind of floored me a little bit. I mean, I had the Chris Ware cover, and um, um, it was published by a major publisher. And, um, and uh, but for a while, you know, there was the, it was slow to to catch on, and, and uh, I mean, in, in um, you know, on the blogs and on the, on the forums and things, but. From what I've checked, I mean, I'm I'm not a, uh, on, on every one of them, but I have checked in, as every author will, uh, to see what's uh, going on. And, and um, there's been a lot of chat in the last two or three weeks that's been really positive. Um, and uh, what's been really nice is someone will post something on a forum and say they really like this book, and then other people say, oh, that sounds interesting, I'll go get a copy. And, um, and some of them, you know, a couple of days later, they'll say they went out and got a copy and, and they liked it. So it's been it's been almost uh, um, universally positive. But I'll tell you something that was really funny, and I don't quite get it. Um, apparently, John Byrne hates this thing without having read it uh, on, <laughs> on his site. Uh, he, is there something that, that says uh, sounds utterly worthless? And that's his only comment on it. But I, I don't know why he would seem so negative about this thing. I mean, other people can have Superman takes as well. See, that, that's that's kind of his. Uh, that's that's kind of his thing. You know, for yeah. John Byrne, unfortunately, so I would, don't take it for anything because it's not <laughs> worth anything. Well, I don't know much about him, but uh, I mean, I knew you know his work, but uh, I don't really know much about his personality. Well, he's one of those guys that does some really really great comics, but. You just got to separate the artist from the from the man because you know he uh, he he has a notorious reputation for being a, a, a I don't know what the word a finicky pesky individual Jerk. whatever you yeah, know yeah just, just a plain <laughs> ass it. is really well he's pesky about my book apparently but <laughs> well I mean he has he's very bitter because in '86 he was brought on to revamp Superman and it was a very successful revamp um, but. Now they're in a mode where they're also once again revamping Superman with the Mark Wade Birthright series. Right, right. And he's just feeling, I think it's you know just he's being tread on. It's a bitter pill. I, yeah, yeah I, I, I really do. Yeah. And his 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 track record for the past couple of years has been very, uh, very antagonistic towards a lot of things. And even though he, it, it, the thing that makes it worse is that the fact that you can sit there and try to have a discussion and talk about things, and he's. It's like it doesn't matter. He doesn't change his opinion. He doesn't. He's not open to what other people have to say. He just formulates his opinion, and he's very uh, belligerent about expressing his opinion. So uh, there, it's gotten to the point now where there's really not much behind any sustenance behind what he says anymore. So it's kind of like for him to say something about your book without even reading it is just you know who cares you know as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, well that was it. I mean, if he read it and, and said it was utterly worthless, that was one thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Uh... Um, I think I think it's great that you did it in that time period, and and you know I, I I didn't have the pleasure of finishing the book yet, so to to find out that it segues into you know the first comic in, in 1938, I think is brilliant, utterly brilliant. I think it's just a great way to take it, and that time period seems to fit with Superman. And, oh yeah, and I one love thing that I loved about it is when you look at the old uh, drawings, you know uh, Joe Schuster's drawings, he's kind of a little guy, you know, um, and he doesn't have to, he didn't look like a, a refrigerator, you know, and, yeah. and uh, <laughs> that's what I that's what I kind of wanted to to write about. When I'm reading it, I, I get the I have the images of of the Fleischer cartoons. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what I really enjoy about that. I think it's kind of really uh, unique and gives it that style. And and even seeing pictures from the new movie coming out next year there's a lot of that art deco uh you know style in that movie and i think there, i haven't seen anything yet from it they showed you know 
departs from the, like a daily planet and things like that, and it has like that Art Deco kind of style to things. And I think that's a great way because I just think that time period really works for Superman. I think it really does. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it, it's it's more difficult, I think, to write um, credible fantasy about a character like that in in the, in, in the, you know the new millennium, you know. But uh, in in the kind of low tech world of the '30s and '40s, it was it seemed to fit um, much easier. I think I'd be hard pressed to come up with Superman stories set now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it just it kind of it kind of. You lose that. You lose some of the edge of it. You know, you lose some of that edge of the the fantasy aspect of it because it's almost like it's it's so accepted in every day. Whereas when you put it back in that era, you know, it really makes it exceptional and really makes it stand out so much. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it it seems fresh in that time. I tell you, um, Tom, uh, it's it's. I, I would assume that it's probably a good compliment, but reading this book. It, it makes me want to know when Volume Two's coming out. You know, when when's the next story? So, uh, you know, I guess you you accomplish your job. In, well, thank uh, you, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't know if there'll be a Volume Two. They'll have to ask me if I want to do another one. But I, I thought it would, would be interesting. Uh, although I don't know if I would do it, would be to jump ahead into, into the fifties, into the early fifties, and, and make him, you know, in his early forties. Um, that would be kind of an interesting time. But uh, thank you, thanks. I'd be interested in reading it. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny, I, I, as much as I love comics and have read comics for seemingly forever, um, I never read a novel based on a comic book, never yeah. before. Because I, I don't know why, but I guess I always just thought they wouldn't be any good. Because I thought, well, what serious author is going to write about comic books? Because comic book writers are a different, altogether different creature than than novelists. And... And uh, I love my novels, and I and I take it pretty seriously. So I thought, and eh, none of these guys are, you know, none of these comic writers could write a novel. And so when we got this book to to read and, and review, I thought, well, okay, well, you know, I'm going to read it. I got this copy. I'm going to read it. And then I, you know, was very pleasantly surprised. And so now it makes me want to go, hmm, what other comic book novels are out there that I can read that will be good? Because now I've found one that is. So that means others could be good as well. So. Yeah, you know, I, I gathered a whole lot of stuff, and uh, um, there was, you know, I've got the, <laughs> I even got the novelizations of the Lois and Clark TV show, and <laughs> I got uh, novelizations of Smallville and stuff, just to see how people, you know, it's really hard in a way to try and you know, to write this stuff um, so that it works in a novel, you know, without the pictures. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I uh, sympathize with 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 all the other people who've tried it, even if I. A lot of times, I don't think you know. I really enjoyed the end product. It um, it, uh, it is a, a hard thing to pull off, and I think it. Um, like I said, I had the advantage of putting it in a time period where I think it's easier to do, rather than um, writers who are are um, um, trying to write novels set now with, with superheroes. Uh, although I hear, I didn't read it, but I hear that um, some people I know like that Batman novel that uh, Andrew Vox did about ten years ago. I have a copy of that on my shelf. I just never. I got it at a, like a library sale for fifty cents or something, and couldn't pass it up. I, just, I never got around to reading it. Yet. No, I haven't either. But some people told me they liked it. I mean, I know for myself, in the in the nineties when comics were kind of on the downswing, and uh, a lot of my characters that I was into, the stories that were being interpreted into the comics were very, uh, not very true to the character, and and not very intriguing stories. It kind of like they didn't know what to do with them, and I found myself actually plunging myself into the novels that were being writ- wrote, written at the time and they were much more true interpretations of the character and into what I was used to reading of the character and much more exciting than the comics were so I was reading a lot more of the novels than I was the comics and actually enjoying them well so when they're done well like this book is um, I find it more enjoyable than reading the comic well that's true you know I, I've always been a superhero fan and, and uh uh, I've been friends with Art Spiegelman for about um, 25 years, and, and we've had our, you know, he has nothing, you know, nothing good to say about the form. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I think there's a lot of good, good stuff that's been done, and it's fun, you know. Uh, but I agree with you that, um, uh, you know, in recent years, not that um, the comic book versions of the, of the heroes that I've liked haven't been very um, compelling for me either. One of the devices you use in the novel are the little captions before each 
uh, uh, chapter, mm-hmm. um, chapters, I guess I should say. And I found that uh, if there was one thing that kind of connected to a comic book, it was that. They were almost like little narrations, really tiny little meanwhiles, you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and the fun thing was reading all the way through and then going back and rereading it again, that, those little uh, captions at the beginning because uh, – it just made even it had more of a, more of an effect after I was done. It, it reminded me of the little things that used to be on the covers. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh huh. Like yeah, I I thought that gave it a real '30s touch for some reason too. I I really liked those little news. They almost seem even like news headlines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. I when I when I was reading the 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 first couple chapters and and I I saw how Clark was and and you know. He, uh, there was a one time where he smoked and he, he called Willie a pain in the ass and I went, whoa, you know, I, <laughs> I've never, I never heard Superman say that. And there's, a, there's other times when he's rough when, you know, like in the, uh, in the one scene with the, with the, with the mob and, uh, mm-hmm. that one, I, and then there, it just, I kind of went, hmm, but then I thought about it and I went, now wait a minute though, when you read those early Golden Age Superman stories, he's throwing people off, or letting them fall off buildings and, and he's not the nice Boy Scout that we know now, and and so I, I actually, I I probably was initially going to be like some of those people on the you know in those reviews where I would say, well, no, this isn't right. But then I went, well, 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 wait a minute. You think about those stories, him and Batman, they were not the epitome of superheroes just yet either. So well, it's true. Know. And if you read the first, I, I love the first few years of, of Superman and action comics. Um, because uh, this before all the, the super villains hit in and and, uh, and the, the the Jerry Siegel stories and and uh, you know there's <laughs> I made fun of some of them in the last chapter but there was were actually you know there there was <laughs> there was a, a story where where Superman went went after uh, uh, reckless drivers and, and there was a story where uh, he destroyed uh, um, uh, Detroit uh, car manufacturing plant because it. it uh, it was building unsafe cars, and I'm saying, yeah, well, this, uh, this is not the Superman that uh, you know I grew up with, um, but he, but it's really fun, and it also seems very much of its time, you know. Um, it seems kind of like a junior WPA guy or a junior New Dealer or something, you know. Uh, um, and it, um, so the things that I had him do um, really are, are very much like Jerry Siegel um, would have done, I think. So. Tom, I understand that you wrote a large portion of this uh, on an island in Maine. Uh-huh. Are, are, you a, are you a big fan of Maine? Well, I am now. <laughs> what happened was uh, uh, this, uh, this writer's colony started a few years ago by a, um, a man who uh, used to be a Hollywood screenwriter and uh, now uh, is in charge of his family business and, and uh, missed being around writers. And uh, he bought an island, a, a, little, a little island um, off the coast of Maine, and built about 12 cabins and, um, uh, and has uh, two sessions. Um, so there would be about 12 people each session for three weeks. And um, so I, I went up there. I, I did an application and, and uh, um, got accepted. And, uh, and uh, I wrote 120 pages in, in three weeks the first year, which was astounding for me. And um, and then uh, hit it off with the guy, and he invited me back. So I've gone back for the past three summers, and I wrote a heck of a lot of this book on that island, um, in that little cabin. Uh, and in fact, uh, they um, on the island they built a little telephone booth where they have a satellite phone, um, and they put it up on a hill, and they hang inside of it. Now they have a, a little Superman costume that they hang inside <laughs> of it because the novel was written on the island. That's, That's funny. Cool. I, I asked that question because uh, my family has been vacationing in Maine for like three generations now. So that's really, where uh, we go to Acadia National Park, a Mount Desert Island, which is Bar Harbor. All right, this is uh, this is off the coast of Jonesport, pretty much up there. Okay, that's cool. It's just beautiful country. Up oh, there. it certainly is. Yeah, saw a you know, bald eagle and a moose for the first time in my life outside, <laughs> outside of a zoo. <laughs> It's funny on the, I'm sure. on the rocky coast of Maine is where I do the majority of my reading. Like when we go on vacation, I'll plow through three or four books when I'm there, and, and so it was it was cool to hear that you wrote it in the similar surroundings. Oh yeah, it was. It's nothing better than just being in an isolated little cabin with no telephones and and uh, um, and just be able to work all day long with no one knocking on your door, which is amazing. 
So have you assigned this novel to your students yet as required reading? <laughs> no, I never do that. <laughs> Although I, I just took my students out tonight. It was the end of the semester, and I took out my grad students, and um, one of them came with the book, and I got to uh, sign it first, and that was nice. She gets an A. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a sure way to inflate the sales if you, know, you all the students had to buy it every semester, you know. <laughs> Let's let's get into a little bit of your background. I mean, uh, you. I was surprised. I mean, I, I was looking up for you know background on you when I went to contact you, and I had no idea you were actual professor at the college, and you actually a doctor uh, as well. Um, in, well. in the sense of your degree in, in uh, literature and. Well, actually, I, I, I'm not a doctor. I have an MFA, MFA degree, which is a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. I'm a professor, but I'm not a doctor. Oh, because they I'm have a, you listed on the faculty thing. Do they really? <laughs> well, good. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it one way or the other. <laughs> but the courses that you teach are, are creative writing? Yeah, I, I teach. Uh, I, I split my time between uh, teaching creative writing mostly in the graduate program um, <clears throat> and um, American Studies courses. So I, I, um, um, I started teaching uh, um, those back in Rutgers back in the late... Oh, late 80s, I, uh, I started teaching an American comic strip course at Rutgers, and uh, then when I came down here, I've, I've um, continued to teach that, but I've turned it into an American comic strip, history of the American comic strip, and then the second half is, is doing graphic novels. Um, so I do that, and that's, <laughs> that's a real popular class. In fact, I just, I'm just teaching it this semester, and it has 170-odd people in it. Wow. Um, and but I also teach a lot of pop culture stuff. I do um, detective fiction and film, and I do uh, you know Hollywood in the '40s and and uh, like the decade course where I teach uh, the literature and uh, culture and uh, pop culture of, of particular decades, like the 1920s or 30s or 40s. So uh, um, those are those are the courses I love to teach um, because in many ways they they grow out of my research, my books. Uh, and in the other way, they feed my research. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's a very symbiotic thing. In the in the world of academia, do you um, are are comics gaining any more acceptability acceptance as a um, as a literary form and not just things that kids read? Oh, you've got to! Be, oh, it's amazing. I mean, as a, I was invited over to do, um, I was teaching at Hofstra back in the 80s, uh, just teaching creative writing, and um, I, uh, I knew a guy uh, who was um, the head of the American Studies Department at Rutgers, who was a really cool guy, who was interested in all kinds of pop culture stuff, and he asked me, would I come over and just teach one class in, on the American comic strip? And I did, and it was a huge success, but it was, um, uh, we would we would joke all the time, students and I, you know, this, the, that their parents would be saying, what? I'm paying for you to take a course on comic strips? Uh, and this went on for a number of years, you know. Uh, and um, But gradually, um, as I've been teaching it over the course of the 90s, it's, it's turning and turning and turning. And now, now um, um, comics are a big deal. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, one of my um, key things of cachet in the university is I am the only guy who does this. Um, and they wish there were more. <laughs> so, uh, and the art school here is, is uh, uh, does have um, uh, classes in sequential art now. Um, uh, the guys, they just hired a guy who was actually a DC artist um, to teach over there. His name went right in my head. He did a, a graphic novel called uh, Enemy Ace a few years ago. I forget his name. George oh, something. Pratt. George Pratt. He teaches here now. Um, so it really has changed. Uh, and now, you know, uh, um, they want me to teach this this um, graphic novel slash comic strip course every semester, and I don't want to do it uh, every semester. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it'll be boring to me, but uh, uh, it's become that popular. Um, and uh, the university itself realizes that this is uh, um, um, something valuable. In fact, we we're, um, we got um, Neil Gaiman to come here to give this big lecture next uh, October um, at the library. So, yeah, it's, um, it is totally changed. Well, that's uh, as good. far as the university's perception of it. Because we, we often have the discussion about you know, how to break comics more into the mainstream, and they have to um, break that, that 
um, stigma. stigma of being just for kids. You know, they, they've done that in Europe. They've done it successfully in Japan. But the United States seems to be holding out and, and, and just and, and it's good to know that. Um, at least the, the people with the real brains are, are accepting it. <laughs> <Not> the real brains. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's true. I mean, it, it, there's so much stuff now. I mean, it, there's so many, like, graphic novels. I, I don't even know what I have to I change. I do different ones every time. Um, whereas, you know, when I started doing this in the late 80s, you know, there was some Eisner stuff and, um, and uh, you know, Mouse. And, uh, but now there's so much stuff. Um, it's um, It's easy to teach the course and uh, but I do make sure that you know I'll do I'll do mouse and I'll do Eisner and I'll I'll do you know Chris Ware but I I'll, I'll do Watchmen and I'll I'll do Frank Miller because I I don't want it to also go the other way I don't want this to be seen as just some kind of a totally literary um uh, and I mean I wanted to show where it comes from and and what you know it is a kind of medium that encompasses all kinds of genres um well so um but the thing is it's it's um uh, night and day from when I started doing this. Fantastic. So you're a pioneer. Yeah, I'm a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, uh, so everyone, this book is available now, and uh, people can buy it, I assume, wherever books are sold? Yeah, wherever books are sold or, or, or Amazon. It's doing really, really well on Amazon. God bless them. It's so easy to just buy it on Amazon. But, yeah, it's, it's out, um, and... Um, Supposedly, it's out on, on uh, at least for the next week or so, it's supposedly out on the front tables at Barnes & Nobles because uh, my publisher made sure it was. So. Excellent. Um, yeah. Is this, um, I mean, it seems like it's starting to pick up some steam finally. Uh, yeah, the, the one thing I was disappointed about, and I don't quite understand it, is that um, the review, there haven't been a lot of reviews. There was a review in the Times and, a re, and an amazing review in the Boston Globe and a few other places, but... Um, um, compared to the re- number of reviews I get from my other novels, it's been it's been slender, and I don't know if simply there are fewer review outlets or um, newspapers are not as as enlightened as colleges as far as um, uh, comic based things, or, or I'm afraid that some people might perceive this as a kind of novelization of some of, of a comic book story. But beyond that, um, the the um, beyond the, the lack of, and it's not like there are no reviews. There's, there's been quite a few, but um, beyond that, um, it's been really good. Um, the response and the sales, so and, uh, not good. Yeah, is this uh, possibly going to be put out on on paperback at some point? Or yeah, um, I was just told last week that um, it'll be coming out um, uh, next fall in paper. Excellent. Great. And are your other books uh, still available? Yeah, the Derby Dugan trilogy, the, the trilogy about cartoonists, uh, is, is uh, still in print um, in uh, trade paperback um, as in a match set. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, that's cool. That, that'd be interested. I mean, that's a smart way to, to package that, too. Because Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's still available. And, uh, um, and I guess a few other my books, but those are the major ones. One of our fellow podcasters, um, before the podcast, casting thing came about he ran a few yahoo groups um, where they were trying to find and and put on the computer online um, all the uh, public domain comic strips um, and i think it blew up into like several six seven eight you know broken up by decades and, and characters even and um, um I'm, if that's something that uh, you know, you'd be interested. In it. I'd love to forward that to you. Yeah, please. I, I'm a I'm a classic comic strip nut. I mean, I, I buy everything that reprints old Orphan Annie or Dick Tracy or Terry and the Pirates or, or any of those things. Little Abner. I just I, I that's my one great regret about comics. That while the comic book seems to be um, um, uh, entering all kinds of interesting areas, and uh, the comic strip is just. Um, um, Shrinking and and right. uh, not much, uh, you know. It's all the same, you know. While there's some really good strips, they're all you know humor strips, and um, and they're all tiny. And uh, yeah. I uh, I miss uh, the real great comic strips that yeah. I grew up with. They're all public domain, and he makes it. Uh, they make it very aware that you know when this stuff is actually reprinted in a format that can be purchased, they do purchase it. So it's they make sure that they're very respectful for. It too. Oh, that's good. So. But it's not. I mean, that stuff. 
when I show it to my students, I, you know, I, I have, I, you know, do hundreds of scans and uh, for my lectures, um, they're absolutely amazed uh, when they look at, you know, pages from from Terry and the Pirates in the War Years or the old Popeye strips that you know, had, you know, 24 panels on a Sunday page and you know all that stuff. They're just amazed by it that this stuff existed. Great. What are you uh, working on now? Are you want to plug? Well, actually, the funny thing I'm working on now, this is totally because of um, the Superman novel, is that uh, Yale University Press uh, has this series, um, this American Icon series, um, where they're trying to tell the history of American uh, American history through um, through particular icons, like um, Wynton Marcellus is doing a book on Louis Armstrong, and, and uh, Gore Vidal did a book on... Uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, and, and they came and said, "Would you do a 150-page essay on um, uh, why Superman matters?" Um, so I'm going to do a nonfiction book on, on basically the character and um, uh, his impact on, on uh, American popular culture and as well as culture. And um, so that's what I'm doing this winter. Actually, I'm not going to be teaching any classes. It'll be a you know a thin, like I said, 150-page book that'll probably come out sometime next year so it'll be kind of a little companion to this and i think i'll i think i'll hang up my cape after that <laughs> <laughs> well you have to keep us informed so when that gets published and such that we i can... will i will very you, you very got built-in beta readers right here yeah you already you got us you got us sucked in so <laughs> well, which thanks. is a good thing okay tom well we really appreciate well, it's been delightful talking to you thank you so much and yes. the best thank of you. luck thank you thank very you. much for coming on i appreciate it i i'm i appreciate your asking me Good night. Good, Good night. night. Thanks. Fantastic. Wow. The uh, once again, the title of the book is "It's Superman." The author is Tom DeHaven. The publisher is Chronicle Books. And uh, I, I mean, I honestly really enjoyed this book, and I enjoyed his writing style so much that I am going to seek out his other novels uh, because it's very, it's very literary. It's a really, really fast read, and not intimidating in, in any way shape or form but it feels like this guy really knows how to write and i mean there because you know, i read a lot of books and there are some that are just like it's like anybody it's like the guy who lives next door to you just wrote a book okay it's a good it tells the story might be great but there's nothing exciting about the words that they use or the or the grammatical structure that they have that makes you it makes it with a punch and, and this guy has this and and i, I really really like that so that's like you know that plays into one of the strong points a few of the strong points that are really enjoying about what i've read so far and, and that realism that that depth where he puts into his characters and makes them so real whereas you know like you said you could buy a novel of star trek or somebody that somebody writes something and yeah you have the characters in and yeah they're on an adventure and stuff but it doesn't pull you in it doesn't right. magnetize you to the characters and this really does i mean i love the period piece that it's in and I love the characters, and that makes you makes me want to read more and and get enveloped and feel like I'm in that time period. I I when I first started reading it, it um, wasn't quite sure where it was going, and obviously that you know he's not going to lay it all out right away. And and I said okay, so I kept reading, and then eventually you get to that point where ah okay here it goes oh more pieces coming together all right so it lays out like you were talking about Brian, and then. Then I did hit that little snag, like I talked about earlier, of, well, this is so different from what I'm used to. And then, but then I had to really stop and think, and so and say, well, no, I guess it's not. You know, it's just that we've never, like he said, we've never seen this. We've never seen pre-action number one. Right. You know, we may have, <clears throat> excuse me, seen updated <clears throat> versions and you know modern retellings, but you never dealt with exactly what happened. And now it's come. To, to stand out for me that this is almost a prequel to action number one. Like, I almost consider this canon. I almost consider this well, part I, of the I was, myth. I was just about to say that. I, I wish that it could be considered canon because I think no one can do it better. I think no. this is it. No, I think if you tried to do it any other way, it wouldn't fit. Right. You know, this is, seems very natural, that it would naturally Absolutely. flow into what has been published. Absolutely. Yep. yep. So I think it's it's brilliant in what it is and what it yeah, did. Yeah, I really to do. recommend uh, guys checking it out um, and let us know if you agree or disagree. But I, I think that you will agree. Uh, it's 
you won't regret picking it. No, up. Yeah. not and, at all. And he's, I mean, there are other things in it too that, like he, the guy when he when Willie takes on the name Willie Boring, which is Wayne, Wayne Boring. Boring was an artist, Superman artist, and there's a Benny Siegel, like Jerry yeah. Siegel, and there's a Chief Parker, which I think is from maybe the Superboy comics or the Adventure of Superman stri- uh, TV series. Black. I'm not sure, but there's a Chief Parker somewhere. And there's a cheap Parker in this book, so he throws in even those little tidbits of uh, of cool little facts. So it's a good book. Yes, yeah. very much. I, I really hope that you know. It seems like I said it's starting to take off a little bit and getting some notoriety and, and starting to, s- to make some sales. So I hope that uh, it continues to trudge on and, and more people come aware of it and pick it up and read it and enjoy it and support it because I think it's really worth it. One of the things we forgot to mention, and actually Kevin pointed it out, the last time we talked about December previews on page 384 in the book section, there's a JSA book, JSA Ragnarok, book one hardcover by Paul Kupperberg and Jeff Johns. A um, little description is, from the dark days of World War II through the modern age, the heroes of the JSA have faced countless magical foes, but when the wizard retrieves the Spear of Destiny... The fate of the world is at stake, and even the most powerful heroes aren't enough to stop the destruction. Twenty-two ninety-five hardcover. Is so, that, uh, do you do you get the feeling that that is taking place in present time, or is that? Um, you think that's pushed back into? I mean, well, let's get Jeff Johns on the phone, and we'll ask him. All right, we'll be, it it is probably Golden Age because um, it says uh, the characters in the JSA are Hawkman, Our Man, Hawk Girl, the Atom, and yeah. the Atom's not part of the current JSA. Right. Uh, Thunderbolt, well, I guess he kind of is, but really the Atom is the one that makes me think maybe it right, is... because Atom smashers in the current... Just right. what I needed. Another thing. I would, this I month know. was going to be a <laughs> slim month for me. No, and now... not me. This, this month is a killer for me, and especially ordering that yet besides. So. Yeah, so I, when Kevin pointed that out, and then I... Call the publisher, maybe we'll get free copies. <laughs> well, we'll get some review copies. Let's go. Never know. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> Hey, uh, just today we got a we got another postcard. Excellent. We got a postcard from Tom Martinek, and it's a really cool uh, one also of like those like a lenticular. Yeah, you you, you flip it back and oh. forth, and it changes, and it's uh, of Luke. course from Star Darth Vader and Luke fighting, and uh, you know from Lucas Films. It's like the nicest postcard I've ever. It's really heavy duty. Feel that? That's they, nice. Well, for that lenticular, it has yeah. to be kind of sturdy. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you, Tom. Excellent. We have to talk uh, about just a little about the fa- fan, the reaction to the Stanley episode. Oh yeah, let's pull up the. Um, I think just uh, overwhelming yeah. that the 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 forum stuff, and I got a few personal emails too, that people are just really so excited about it. Not only f- not only for us, you know, that we, you know, but also that they were able to be a part of that as well, which is you know, which is all the reason why we do this. Exactly. You know? And I think it was so neat that we finally, instead of, you know, here's an interview with so-and-so, we just kind of, like, melded it right yeah. into the episode. And I thought that, you know, it was a, a brilliant thing to do to allow people to get that experience and have that, you know, extra zing to it yet besides. The <laughs> first the first comment on the forum was from Ben Weldon, and he says, 30 minutes into the show and I'm picking my jaw up. <laughs> I'm glad that everybody, you know, is responding to it and, and had a wonderful time because, as you can tell, which a lot of people have posted on the forum, that they could tell that we were just as giddy as they are listening to it, which how can you not be? But, uh, you know, that's what it's all about, you know, it, putting it out there and uh, have fun with it. Enjoy it. Well, I and, and I posted – in this thread, there are now five pages of responses to this episode, but uh, um, you know, so many of the of the responses that we got were very heartfelt. You know, people really liked hearing Stan, and 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 you know, part of it might be that you know, and these people on the forum are most of our you know, like hardcore listeners or whatever, whatever you want to call them, and right. so they they've been with us for a while. They feel like they know us. They feel like we're friends of theirs or whatever. And, and so they felt like they were experiencing the interview with us. And, and, and so it, it touched a little deeper to them, the same way that it touched very deep to us. And, and when I was reading all these things, I, I was practically tearing up, like literally, because it was like, wow, you know, this is, this is a big deal. I mean, it, it, it's something it's, that 
you, for for a com, for a long time comic fan and everything, it, it's very personal, you yeah. know, to talk to Stan Lee, and and it was just really really cool. And you don't know nowadays, you know, because you know, I mean, everybody knows who Stan is, but do you have that attachment to Stan? You know what I mean? Whereas, like, you know, for me, it's natural because that's the books I started reading when I was growing up. So, I mean, he's been a part of my life for you know thirty years. Yeah. You know, now you have people that are on the forum that are in their early 20s, you know, and such, and not saying they didn't read it. It's brilliant that they have the essentials and they had that opportunity to read that early stuff. But, you know, like I said, you know, when I was reading books in the 70s, Stan was still part of the Marvel and still interactive with Marvel. I mean, you saw him doing things. He was still, and he's not just Stan Lee Presents, you know. And so I was kind of wondering how the reaction would be amongst the people who listened to the episode because I was wondering, you know, will it really touch them as a way it has, you know, influenced, you know, us and, and other people. But uh, it, it's wonderful to see that. And just like with all the other interviews we do, that, you know, uh, with Doug Munch and, and Denny O'Neill and, and Joe Kubert and, you know, that people who aren't really aware of these guys or aware of of who they are and what they have influenced in the industry get to know them in a way more so than just reading an article in a magazine and uh and it's like it's like continuing their legacy on to another generation or two generations and and that's what i really love about having these legends that we interview and 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 put out there for for other people to to appreciate yeah passing the torch on yeah Yeah. because i know when you talked about it before you know brian he he does. He transcends comics for us. Absolutely. I mean, right. he does. This is like meeting your favorite movie star, or your, or well, yeah, like your favorite movie star. You know, um, you know, it, it was almost the reason why we didn't want to talk about his comic history because there's so much out there, right? And we just wanted to talk to Stan. Just talk to Stan. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Hook says, um, "Wow, simply wow." With episode 83, CGS has officially arrived. I've always been impressed with the guests CGS has had. Some of them were already heroes of mine. Some of them, like Mike Norton, who weren't, now are my new heroes. But to have Stan Lee on your show takes things to a whole new level. The highest possible level in my book. This was my Christmas gift from CGS, to have Stan on my favorite show. So that, that's what I mean. Like, that's yeah. personal to and, and a lot of people yeah. said about the Christmas gift thing, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm just so happy that the listeners... Or ha- or had as much fun with it as we did. That was my and birthday that's present. all I can say. So. Yeah. That was my birthday present, so <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly something that I'll never forget. No, absolutely not. Uh, one of our uh, listeners, uh, Bob, in, uh, in California, JLA fan yeah. online, yeah. He, uh, he sent me an email uh, with a picture that he has uh, standing next to Stan at one of the conventions out in uh, the the first Wizard World Los Angeles convention a couple of years ago, and uh, you know he said it was I like guess, the greatest moment of his life. I and, guess that's what I'll have to do. I'll scan that picture, and then I was telling you when I met him at Philly, and right. and, and put that on the forum so people can see. Them. Of course, yeah. I'd be embarrassed to see me, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, because it was like the early '90s, and you know, Stan's gonna look the Trent's same. A little, yeah, yeah, Stan, Stan looks the same. same. <laughs> I look like a freaking Fruit Loop, but. <laughs> But yeah, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind sharing that at all. Do, do you, Brian? Do you want to share the the email that that Stan sent us back to your? Oh yeah, let me let me find. Because I thought that was very very cool. That you know, Brian sent uh, a thank you email to Stan for being on the show, and, and of course, Stan was very. Uh, I don't even know what to say, but he was you know very cordial in, in replying and and took the time to reply. And and uh, Brian, go ahead and read it. He says. Uh, Thanks for cluing me into the interview, and especially thanks for all the nice things you said about me. For a while, I thought you were talking about someone else. Anyway, after hearing all those laudatory comments, I've decided to give up writing. I'm going to run for public office or maybe apply for a Nobel Prize. (laughs) Seriously, you have a great webcast, and you do it like a real pro. I enjoyed every minute of it, even when you foolishly stopped talking about me. Lots of luck with your broadcasting, and happy holiday, Stan. I mean, that, that in itself there is just, you know, print it out and frame it. <laughs> yeah. Along with the, when the first, the first one he said, you know, and he, he actually agreed to the interview, which I, you know, I, I started shaking when I read it. And, and then he said, you know, until then, Excelsior, you know, until then, Stan, Excelsior. You know, uh, like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one thing I did miss. I thought, you know, I was waiting for the Excelsior, Stan at the end, and he just put Stan. So 
That just, was in the first email. So. I mean, how did that? How did that? How did that feel, Brian, to get an email from Stan Lee when you first I, agreed to doing the thing? I mean, yeah, I, I it was exactly yeah I, mean, <laughs> I was looking at it going this is not this oh my that's god that's actually a post somebody posted exactly that they just put a whole blank thing and at the end they were like uh, i'm speechless yeah, yeah. yeah i remember seeing that because uh, i yeah it was it was crazy because you know i mean you send email all day long to all different people and and some are from people that are a little more important than other people and you know okay that's just part of the thing and then you get an email from Stan. You know, I, I mean, it's just, it's a whole other level. I mean, it is, that's exactly what I was going to say. It is another level because, I mean, we've gotten, we've received emails from all of the creators that we have interviewed and such. And, and, and getting those is just as exciting as well. But, I mean, this one, like you said, transcends even those other emails and just takes it to a whole other level. Yeah, it's like if, uh, you know, Prince Charles, well, not even Prince Charles because I don't care about him. But, you know, somebody, <laughs> it's like somebody like that, you know. Because, yeah. I mean, for... For my dad, getting an email from Stan Lee is like, well, whoop de doo You know, you know, he he's heard his name, but he doesn't really care about him. But exactly. for me, it's a big damn deal. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad the listeners really enjoy and appreciate and and uh, really take it to heart for Stan for who he is. I think it's just wonderful to hear that from all the people that have posted on the forum. And we do we we are working to bring you uh, many more interviews. We have a bunch that uh, are in the works. Uh, you know, I mean, clearly, yeah, we're not they stopping. can't necessarily be any bigger than Stan, but you know, they can still be great interviews. And so, and some of them are are very important as well. So, absolutely, we're working on getting them out to you. As as we've proven with all the interviews, everyone's important. Everybody has. Oh yeah, and and you know that's. That was the one thing that this was the Stanley interview was the first one where I was truly nervous. I mean, maybe the first interview we did way back when because I, I wasn't used to interviewing people yet. I was right. nervous for a different reason. But then even when we did Joe Kubert and Gene Cole, I mean, these are big names. I wasn't really nervous, you know. We, we just but Stan, I was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, you can get it, it is, and what somebody brought up on the on the forum too is the fact that you know the we call them by their first name and we you know we don't act like you know oh mr lee mr you know it, it, and and that's how the thing is that's when i when we do the interviews that's how i am i i don't sit there and go like you know i gotta make sure i address him properly and blah, you know to us to me i should say i can speak for myself but when we're interviewing these people they're people you know and that's how i reflect upon that i don't get all sucked in i appreciate who they are and i'm enamored to be able to interview them but it's still there, you know. It's like talking to a person. It's just like what we talk about when you go to conventions. They are people, and you talk to them and address them like people, and they respond like people. It's right. very simple. People, people who need <laughs> people. <laughs> okay. People are strange. Yeah. <laughs> All I can um, think of is Depeche Mode. People are people. There you go. Why should it be? You and I get along so awkwardly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, yep. What are we doing? Is it that time? It's almost that time. Almost that time. Is it almost that time? A couple more seconds and it'll be. Oh, oh that there time. it is! Yeah. Yeah. You know, remember when you made fun of me like the first time I played this song? Like, what the hell is this? And now you, you, you know it and you expect it. And it's like, I feel like Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan. We'll have to do a mashup with, of this. I think it might fit. This and, <laughs> and Numa Numa, it might fit. It's a CGS Numa Numa song. <laughs> I'm try it. Okay. I didn't even pick out one yet. Here <laughs> Gee. <laughs> well, we were talking about, you know, important stuff. Make it easy. My, my brain is frostbitten. Oh, too bad. I'm going to make it hard. I got an audio one here. Just give it a couple seconds to download. Okay. I mean, you never know what's coming. I can't even can't pre-screen even, it. Yeah, you I know? was going to say. Can't even get a feel for it. We all get clobbered. Okay. This is from uh, Michael Sims from Earth-2.net. Oh. Hey guys, this is Michael David Sims. I'm better known as Yoda at the forums. Uh, and I thought I'd send in an audio stump the Rios. So without further ado, here we go. First question. 
How did Victor Von Doom's face become horribly scarred? I'm going to assume he's talking about the first time. I would, yeah, uh, that's how I, I would mean, interpret that, it. Yeah. Um, his experiment that he was working on that Reed Richards tried to show that show him that he had a few digits off, you know, decimal points or whatever, um, blew up. And he had a little scar on his face. Here's the answer. Despite what many people think, it wasn't the lab explosion that resulted in his expulsion from college. It was, in fact, when he put the still molten hot mask on his face for the very first time. See, Question two. Stop that for a second. See, that's later. I was going to say that later when he was in Tibet, they put the thing on. But right. the original, so I, I wasn't sure which one he was But see, that's, that's never been truly defined as far as what I, I mean. And when you, when you read that you know, issue of Fantastic Four, I mean, the blast happens to the machine. And the next time you see him, he's sitting in a hospital bed with his whole head wrapped up in bandages. You know, and then he says, like, I'm, you know, he looks in the mirror after they take the bandages off, and he's like, can't stand to look at himself. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why he, he leaves, because he doesn't want to be part of it. Plus, he gets expelled, you know. Because see, and, I, and then I thought when they finally developed his backstory to add to his, his arrogance, they wanted to show that it was a little sliver of a scar. Right. And then he, you know. And Burned his, did and, that, I think. Yeah, and then he puts the thing on his face, and he goes, runs out in the snow. and Yeah, you know. right. <clears throat> so it's, I would have actually answered that, but I didn't know which one he wanted. So are we scrubbing that one? Let's see what he's got. But yeah, I kind of, <laughs> it, it, to me, it's, it's tough. It, it, like he should have specified, you know, was, but I, I you know, I don't know. It's, it, it's one of those things because. Because even in that origin story where it is horribly scarred, they do show him looking in the mirror after the explosion. He has like that little, and he's like, oh, my face. My well, they face. never showed it clearly. It's like a reflection in the mirror. That, right. Yeah. They never show specifically, I mean, as far as my recollection they've never like showed a picture of his face so you can determine whether he has just a little scar or yeah. if he has more than just that little scar but i know burn tried to imply more or less that it was just a little superficial yeah just a little thing and and you know he just got so caught up in because he was so vain about himself and, but uh I, so yeah I we'll see okay. we'll see what Question the other two. what literary works are housed in the library of sandman's dream Shakespeare, the works of Shakespeare. Again, here's the answer. The library is filled with all of the unfinished, unpublished, and unwritten works of every author ever. Final question. <laughs> when Franklin Richards was abducted by Nathaniel Richards and taken to the future, he returned as a teenage hero. What did he call himself? So you know what name is jumping out? Psylord is jumping out, but I think that's his MC2 name in that MC2 universe. <laughs> the hell what the he heck is him? MC2? That's uh, with the whole verse, the A next version of Marvel where the Spider Girl comes from. And, you know, they had uh, that female Captain America. American character. Dream. Yeah. Mm. It was like the yeah. A next, like the next Avengers. I never read any of that yeah. stuff. But I, yeah. I think he was called Psylord there. And I think I'm. Mixing my because they had names. the what the Fantastic Five was that that yeah. from that from that A next universe or whatever. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything. It's probably going to wind up being just a name, <laughs> Hank, <laughs> <laughs> Timmy. <laughs> The answer to that would be Psylord. Peter, I hope you uh, had bad luck and didn't get any of these. Sorry, mate, but, you know, I got to hope that I actually stumped the reels there. If you guys don't mind me dropping a shameless plug here, um, I'd like it if everybody visited my website, earth2.net. That's earth-the-number-two.net. Uh, and listen to our podcast, uh, earth2.net, the show. It can be downloaded from the site and from iTunes. That's it for me. Talk to you guys later. Pulled it out. Cool. <laughs> Because you know, people on the forum would have been like, no, you didn't answer that first one. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, because that's what I was afraid of. That's yeah. why I, I was going to answer this, both. I was going to say the first and the second just, one. Yeah, I should have. Cover your bases. Yeah. That way you know for sure. <sighs> well, now you know from now on. that Don't worry about trying to isolate it into yeah. one answer. Yeah. So that's cool. Sometimes it, 
the, 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 the stuff that sticks in your head, you know? It's like, the You know, hell? I couldn't think of it either. And as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's probably it. But then, you know, mm. you just never know. So uh, do we want to do our new segment? Well, sure. We're going to start um, our Marvel events segment like we did for DC. And the first one we're going to start with is Marvel Superhero Contest of Champions from 1982. One? 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 I thought it was one. I forget. I, I could be wrong, though. You know me. Yeah. From <laughs> August. Uh, yeah, this says 1982. Okay. <laughs> Three issue. Mi- <laughs> I just looked at that, you know, a week yeah. ago, and uh, <laughs> three issue miniseries. Um, it uh, the basic premise is that the, uh, there's an elder of the universe named Grandmaster, and one of his brothers named Collector died, and he wants to bring him back because supposedly he's supposed to be immortal. So he decides to run a contest, run a game against this figure that at first is called the Unknown, and if he wins the collector would be brought back to life. So they pull all these Marvel Universe characters, they divvy them up into 12, two groups of 12, and they have to go find um, a, uh, a section of this thing called the Golden Globe of Life, I think it is. And um, Two groups of 12? Yeah, yeah they, there's four, four sections. Groups of... Well, there's four sections. Well, they're, they're then split up into four groups oh, of, of okay. three. Yeah, because each, start off with 12 each mission, there's... Three characters from each team, mm-hmm. right? And there's four, and there's four, four globe, four sections of the globe, right? So there's twelve members on each team. All right, yeah. So um, what you got? What'd you think? We all read it just recently, right? Yeah, I needed to finish the last couple well, of pages, and then Kevin came over and <laughs> I just th- I distracted. <laughs> oh, so he probably doesn't know the the, the, the outcome. Ooh. No, I don't know what happens. Oh, <laughs> spoiler! We're gonna have to spoil it because that's a huge mistake. Well, I think there's a few things that takes place that you know. Do you mind? Well, here, <laughs> yeah, what? quick read it. What, quick what, read it while are we, we going to spoil it for the audience? Well, we did kind of for the DC ones because, these, and this one isn't. Yeah, but who cares about DC? This is yeah. Marvel now. We can't spoil Marvel. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is like, isn't isn't this like the first major like universe gathering of heroes? I there know are more I know heroes in there that I never heard oh of. My God. Oh man! I know. I thought it'd be one cool thing uh, to do. Uh, yeah, that double page splash page that they have all that you know. And, and John Romita Jr. Early, when early, his early, early years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When he was doing his Iron Man and starting out on Spider Man, and well, some of these were created for the miniseries. Right. Like that, that that was one of the trivia questions I was going to do for the thing that there's there's I think at least five. Yeah. Five profound heroes that are specifically created for this kind were they of ever used again after this then uh yeah uh, shamrock uh, peregrine i think was and yeah um say i don't know if she was sabra was no she was in the hulk I yeah think. she yeah, okay. she's you know there's a collective man there was blitzkrieg was it defense defense or defense or la peregrine and was it this one Ta- is that talisman or talisman and... talisman I think Talisman has appeared after this. I know Le per- I don't know how to pronounce it. Le Peregrine or whatever. It's a French word. Peregrine. Le- yeah, like a bird. Yeah. Peregrine bird. Le Peregrine. And, I, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think Collective Man has also appeared in X-Men, I think, hmm. after that. But like Blitzkrieg and Defensor, I don't remember right. seeing again. I mean, these are the, when I read this, I went, oh, this is very strongly reminiscent of the Global Guardians of you know what DC has, where they have like all these country heroes, you know, heroes yeah. for, for for their country. Um, I never knew that about this miniseries until I read it. That which I did think was kind of cool that when they you know develop these, mm-hmm. because I like that. I don't like everything being all in the same. Like you know, you have all this Marvel universe in New York City. You know, I like yeah. it when there's there's diversity and they're spread out um, along amongst the globe. But overall, well, I thought. I thought it was a cool. I mean, at the time, again, you know, you take it into context. Um, I think it still kind of holds up. It's still a fun read. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, reading this when it came out, you know, I read it and got it when it came out on the shelves, and it was exciting to to read this to see all your heroes together and and you know that that they were going to be teaming up for this thing. And I was almost kind of disappointed that they did pick two teams of twelve. I thought it was kind of be cooler to 
you know, be have more. Just use all of them. Yeah, just have this huge, you know, all out thing. But I understand why. Right. But, uh, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I thought it was great to do. And what, I th- what's funny is that when the gathering of the heroes and that little thing that they're in, it's very reminiscent of what they do later with Secret, Secret Wars. Wars. Yeah. Well, yeah. In the beginning, I'm like. Okay, Secret, Secret Wars, Wars is totally unoriginal now. <laughs> you know, I just got done reading Secret Wars and thought it was really cool. <laughs> Considering this was, what, two years before Secret Wars? And it was also, like, two years in the making before it even came out. They say uh, it was originally conceived in the winter of 1979 as a treasury edition based on the Summer Olympics. Uh, but then things happened, and then it just came out. Kind of like know. grew. Yeah. And one of the things that people don't know is that in the back, they have the index of the characters in each issue, which... What is what led into doing the Marvel handbooks, mm-hmm. the Marvel Universe handbooks? There's yeah. a, there's a. I'm gonna scan it into the for, for the form, but there was a very interesting panel that I point that I had to see, that I mentioned this oh, one here, yeah, yeah. where with Marvel's Illuminati in the New Avengers coming mm-hmm. out, there's a panel where Doctor Strange, Fantastic Four, Professor X, and Iron Man gather to talk about the situation. Um, Dr. Strain wa- walks up and he goes, well, gentlemen, has your pondering solved this puzzle? Reed Richards says, there's nothing to go on. There's nothing to go on, Dr. Strange and Professor X says, and yet I sense a vast intelligence coming near. And I looked at this and I went, whoa, here's an in-house, maybe totally dumb luck precedence for the Illuminati. Right here, you're only missing uh, Namor and uh, Black Bolt. Yeah. Um, I was like, wow. So it's on page uh, 16. I'll scan it in so people can see it. I that's thought that was really neat. Yeah. And, and who knows? Maybe that's where they yeah, – maybe. maybe. Maybe that's where they it. started pulling that from. They saw that. And, you know, with the way – you know, some of these writers, and I know I've mentioned it, but I'll go out on the ledge. But Bendis, you know, he does – he's one of those writers where he likes to go back and pull stuff, obscure stuff and, and things from history that may not have been touched or, or uh, little moments that maybe were not meant to be anything, but – um, he can go back and make them relevant and bring them into current continuity and, and, and embellish on them. So. And what's interesting about this is that you know, they're not – I mean, I assume that they probably have met each other before, but there's no introduction. They're just walking together, you okay. know, and, and they start – I thought that was really kind of cool. Um, so are we going to – You do whatever you think you need to do. I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't well, know. Should we let just me, say that there's – go ahead. Let me ask this question. Are these easily found? Are they 50-cent bin things, or are they expensive issues, or what's the story with No, them? they're not. Um, no, they're not easily found? <laughs> they're not, not easily. <laughs> well, I mean, they're not hard to find, I don't think, but... They're not 50 cents? They're not 50 cents. Um, but they're also not, like, $20. No, no. I mean, I think you could you could easily buy probably a very fine near men set of all three issues for probably, like, 10 bucks. Um, if you go into your local comic store or something like that. Now, go to a show... You might get lucky and find an issue or something in the 50 cent box or a dollar box, maybe, maybe. But I think uh, from what the sensing I'm getting, when we first started talking about this, I started researching because I could only find like issue two and three, and they were like my original copies that were kind of like beat up, you know. Because, you know, when you asked to borrow them, I was like, holy shit, I I can't find number one, you know. And I must have sold it at one point. And then I went and dug through my stuff and found that I had the three issues but i was going on ebay figuring like well i need to get a set now because it bothers me that i don't have them and when i was checking them out i mean they were selling for like 10 10 bucks or so wow um because i think i got number two for like maybe two bucks so i think it's it's kind of one of those things that it may not be super hot but it's something that people want to get you know i I was because i don't remember ever seeing i never even heard of it until you gave it to me i was like oh what the heck is this uh, so I mean, they did eventually make Contest of Champions two, I and mean, that was quite some time after that. But it's not anything what this is. This is. I thought it was going to be kind of cool, you know. We'll talk about the second one later on. But for this one, I think it's great. I, I think don't it, think the second one's on my list actually because it's so it's bad. Not, well, <laughs> not, not I, I bad, thought maybe since you know what I mean. I thought at least since we talked about this one that we would at least touch upon it at some point. Yeah. You know, when we go through the put it on your list, Peter. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> mm. it, the thing about this one that, that kind of – there was a lot of exposition in and in a lot of the dialogue. Like when, they, when, when you first meet all these characters, they're always like, you know, well, I, I – uh, Angel was flying around when I got oh, zapped, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? And my mutant – you know, there's always – there's a lot of that. And right. it's like, whoo. But, you know, you understand why they're doing it. It's, a, it's a, an event. And, but um, – I mean, you can't beat – I mean, it was – 
It was written by Mark Runewald, Bill Mantlow, and Stephen Grant. And, uh, of course, the art was John Romita Jr., mm-hmm. So, which, again, was his... When he was really getting strong and, and, and starting to do monthly books. And I love it. I mean, I love it. I still love the art to this day. So now that should be you know traded for like seven ninety nine or something. Yeah, it's yeah, I, like I agree. Five ninety five. I mean, they traded well, Secret Wars. Like they, that, should, right? they should trade this because this 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 is just as important and just as fun of a read as Secret Wars is to me. I, maybe they don't. <laughs> I don't know now if I want to. Uh, I'll just let the listeners you know catch and you catch up on it. I mean, maybe the reason why they don't trade it because because <laughs> yeah because of, of yeah well, mm-hmm. the, the thing, ending well, yeah well thing. All right, we'll just leave it go and let Brian finish reading it, and if the readers have it or if they want to read it or whatever, and then when we continue doing the the Marvel events, we'll talk, we can, about, we'll it talk about it again. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll we'll go into a little more. It needs to be. T- <clears throat> excuse yeah. me. It needs to be talked. Yeah, about. it is definitely. I mean, I read it the first time, and I read it, and I thought, well, maybe I screwed up, and then I went back and reread it, and so it's definitely uh, it's definitely relevant, and, and definitely deserves to be talked about. The other thing that okay. that I kind of liked too also was um, the, the the when they had to go find those separate pieces. It's very reminiscent of or, uh, that they must have taken that aspect with uh, JLA Avengers because they also have to find like right. the objects yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. he also picked up on that. And I think that issue might even be called Contest of Champions. So I thought that was cool. That's true. I never paid attention. To that. Yeah, you could be right. I'll have to check that. But it is kind of neat, you know. It's it's nice to see him paired off like that and and see. Um, certain heroes meeting for the first time and then actually, you know, having to be chosen on a different team and having to fight each other or, you know, con- confront each other to to get the, uh, obtain the object, mm-hmm. you know, as the final goal for that mission. So it's, it's very interesting. And they're put all across the globe. Every time there's a new mission, a globe is hidden in a certain place and it's a different part of the, of the earth. So it's not all done at one point. So you just right. get transported into a, a different section of the earth so check it out three it issues. is it's fun it's a very <laughs> fun read you, you won't regret getting it you know it's it's really kind of a neat thing that uh, marvel put together for a universe to have all their mm-hmm. heroes together so kind of a prelude to secret wars i kind of think but it's much more it has much yeah. more characters every character is involved i mean just look at that double page spread in yeah. issue one i mean it's like every marvel hero is there so Cool. So we'll let that open ended and allow everybody to get a chance to check that out and uh, and see if they can catch <laughs> the secret of the contest of champions. <laughs> <laughs> the secret war of contest of champions. Oh, what? the mysterious mysteries <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of the unfathomable know. mystery. <laughs> uh, what do we got? Should we call somebody quickly? Yeah, let's try it. We can we can have them ride out with us since we're down to the wire. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. All right, uh, we're calling Lennon Patton in Oklahoma. Where the winds come sweeping down. This was like the sing episode. Sing along. <laughs> so, vamp vamp. Yada yada, blah blah. I think uh, it's neat to hear that people are really responding to the uh, off the rack episode. Yeah, they love it. They like that segment. Uh-oh. Jeez, it went immediately to voicemail. So we'll try someone else. Like I couldn't, even, I couldn't even flip it over to the computer before it was picking up. I, I was waiting for a ring and there was no ring. Oh yeah, so we may have to. Yeah, maybe we'll skip this. Okay. <laughs> we're we're, we're kind of getting down to the wire, and we, yeah, we forgot something that we had to do. So If we get wrapped up starting to talk to somebody, yeah. we're going to end up running out of steam here. Yeah. Damn garage band and its time <laughs> limits. <laughs> Apple, we need unlimited time. Unlimited power. Just uh, give me a second here. I pull something up. Uh-huh. Excuse Should me I while I whip this out. Well, you know what uh, what that off the rack is doing? It's actually making me read. I know that's what I like about it. I uh-huh. like that everybody's into it, but it's getting me to go like, you know what? I gotta read. Something. I gotta read something so I make sure that I have something to talk about. You know, 
and and you don't know we don't know we don't talk about beforehand of what Mm-mm. who's going to talk about what you know so it's it's you know you you got to have something prepared so i think it's cool too because yeah. it, it it gives me that element of like hey this is i'm not reading this you know somebody else can kind of give me a little understanding or comprehension of what's going on do i want to try to read that do i want to pick that up you know yep. or do i agree with what you're getting out of it you know so yeah. i think it's cool all right. I guess we'll wrap it up. Yep. Okie dokie. Very good. This episode of Comic Geek Speak was brought to you by E. Gerber Products, uh, the industry leader in long term storage sleeves for your collection for the best Mylar uh, bags. Visit them at www.egerber.com. E. Gerber Products, the protector for the collector. And if you would like to send us an email, send it to comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. And thanks to the guys at upallnightgaming.com for hosting the website. Uh, Please continue to vote for us at Podcast Alley. We're getting more and more votes every day, and we need every single one of them. And we have some new T-shirts on the website that you can order now. And uh, I just got one today, and they look fantastic. They look very cool. Really, really nice. Very so well um, uh, they're they're worth it. Um, and a big thank you to Tom DeHaven for being on the show. Absolutely. And if you have not, go buy a copy of It's Superman because it's worth every penny. It's super. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a reminder that this uh, episode. Of Comic Geek Speak is brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com, your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment related columns, contests, features, reviews, news, resources, and more. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time.